Okay, good night, good night, good night, good night, good night. This is crazy. This is crazy, folks. This is absolutely crazy. Uh, anyway, you know what? I'm going to pray for this internet. So listen, it's not my fault tonight. Honestly, I was on this thing by 7.40. And this stupid computer rebooted by itself and take like 66,000 years to load everything. And when everything was loaded and I'm trying to sign into StreamYard, it's just giving me these bunch of crazy stuff. But hey, nevertheless, we're not going to allow that to... Uh, get the better of us. So I do apologize for the extremely late start. Of course, this is not my intent. And it still appears as if I'm still lagging for some reason. But anyway, <clears throat> we're not going to get into all of that. All right. Tonight is going to be a good night. As you would see, our topic here is spiritual protocols that manifest God's promises. This is something that I have promised to squeeze in before Saturday, because as most of you would know, Saturday, I begin my marriage, divorce and remarriage series. Again, I cannot emphasize enough, call a neighbor, tell a friend, call whoever, because we're really going to uh, bring some spiritual insight. Where are we? Some spiritual insight into this particular understanding. I don't know why this thing is lagging. I don't know. Okay, anyway. Yeah, so yeah, so Saturday is going to be a big one for all of us. This is a, a long awaited teaching. Everybody's been asking me about this particular teaching. And it was something that I told you I didn't get the release on this. I finally did and decided to pick the beginning of the year, January, to begin this series. As I would promise you with all of my teachings, it's going to bring you revelation, it's going to take you from tradition to scripture. Uh, most uh, teachings that I've heard on marriage, divorce, and remarriage was always people's personal opinion. And it was a tradition that was passed down for many, many years. I've heard many, many, many preachers that said that if you were married before and if your spouse whom you divorced is still living, you cannot marry another person. And that is not true according to the scriptures. All right. And what I realized was that a lot of people, when they uh, teach on these things, again, they teach it from a hand me down perspective. This is what their leaders believe. So uh, they went and teach what their leaders said, as opposed to uh, what they read in the Bible. <clears throat> and this is going to be no different from my teaching on, on tithes, how we are not supposed to give it. We are not commanded by law to do so. And of course, I had all the naysayers that came at me. And like I always tell you, when they come at me, they, they're coming with, they're coming defending their traditional beliefs and their church policies. And the sad part is when you do show them the multitude of scriptures, like I always do, I want them to understand at that point, you're not fussing me anymore. You're telling the Bible or God that I don't believe what your word says. I believe what my pastor or my leader says. So, That'll be on you. My job is to give you the unadulterated truth. Take it or leave it. That's totally up to you. But you will see clear cut in scriptures. Clear cut. All right? Clear cut. And as usual, like I said, I give multiple scriptures, uh, not to prove a point, but to show you this is what the scripture says. So you have plenty of people uh, whose spouses left them or they were divorced for whatever reason, and they are in bondage. They actually... Uh, home and refuse to uh, get married to somebody else because they figure they're going to go to hell. Now, they will sleep around. They will have sex. They would masturbate. They would do those things. So they feel if they, once they're done with that act, they could quickly say, God, forgive me, and life goes on. But they have been convinced by others, and again, they didn't read the Bible for themselves, that if you were to get married again, that you are hell bound. Okay. And then some wild preachers will tell you if you're married and you were married before and the other spouse is still living, that you now have to break up that union. Now, these are the same people who have told you initially God don't like divorce. But they say, no, divorce that person, even though God don't like it, 
he wasn't supposed to be married anyway. So leave that. So I'm not here to show up anybody as usual. I'm not here to make myself look intelligent, make them look stupid. That's never my intent. My intent is to destroy something that I've been doing for years, and that is the tradition of men. It is the ideologies, it is the uh, opinions, it is the policies, and all of that mumbo-jumbo that have nothing to do with the Bible. And like I would have said in my last teaching, you know, it's just amazing the, the hypocrisy of man's policy. And I was telling you about the lady who I know of who was married before, and her husband, who was not a Bahamian citizen, married her with the sole intent, she didn't notice, and he gave no sign of it, that he wanted uh, a better, an easier way to attain a Bahamian citizenship. And he knew it would have been true being married to her. After he would have secured his marriage and so on and got sorted out, he eventually divorced her. One day he just picked up and left. They were very much a part of a church, had great positions in the church. And remember, this man left her. This woman was, was devastated. I mean, on the brink of losing her mind because there were no warning signs. But clearly, when he achieved his objective, he left. And the church was of no support to her because their rule is, hey, look, if you, if you got a divorce, whether he left you or not, that's your problem. We don't stand for that. And as a result of that, you cannot be a participant in the... Uh, the day-to-day -day functions of this church, meaning that you cannot come up here to pray, you cannot do the praise and worship, you cannot usher, you cannot do any of this. But what I found to be so nasty and evil of these wicked demons was this. They had no problem collecting her tithe. They had no problem collecting her seed. They had no problem her gifts of love and pastoral $100 bills pinning on her shirt. Oh, they were absolutely no nothing evil about that. In fact, God loved that. But when it's time to participate in the things of God, it was no problem. I was further confused because the same church who begs people for money consistently that this lady went to, they will tell you that giving is a form of worship. They would say this. And I even pointed this out to this lady. I say, I say, I hope you're seeing the hypocrisy here and hope that you see why it is important to read the Bible for yourself. Your pastor is not smarter than you. God has just called him to educate you, which he has refused to do or to bend it or contort it to his liking so that you would look to him and not to God. And as a result of that, when you buy into that, they are able to manipulate you however they choose. So here it is. You are left with these children. This guy moved on with his life. Okay, he never was interested in no church. He just played along to make it look like he really was a part of a family. So, of course, whenever they came to really check to see if this was a solid family before they granted the citizenship, he would be in right standing. He achieved that. And all of the evidence was there. So she's left holding the bike, and her church was with absolutely no support because their rule is if you were divorced, you are in sin. Listen to how sick these fools are. You are in sin if you divorce. Like she forced the divorce on herself. Like she went and she begged the courts and she begged the, 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 the judge and this guy. She was a victim. And he just walked. So like I said, this demonic synagogue of devils that she attended, I have no apologies for it. Because as usual, I am highly aggravated when I see a so-called house of God have always could make exceptions to any rule that they made when it comes to money. When it comes to money, you could just murder anybody. As long as you pay us a certain amount, we are willing to excuse that. And it remind me of scripture in the Bible, uh, Jesus was talking about, uh, what was he talking about? Anyway, there was a particular word that was used. Anyway, this is what the word meant, and maybe some of you remember the scripture. I think Jesus was talking about tradition or something of that sort, and he was saying how they had this, I don't know what it is, but anyway, what if you did something wrong, let's say you curse your mother out. The evil Pharisees back then had this rule that if you brought something very valuable and precious and put it in the church treasury, there's a word for it. I did a teaching on it. I cannot remember it now. 
that they were able to expunge whatever evil that was. And Jesus says, but here it is, God says that if a child curses his mother or father, that he should be put to death or his light should be put out. But you Pharisees, you decide to change the rules and you said if they are able to bring some monetary, something that can benefit you and this organization, because it's clearly it's not a church of God, that you are not only willing to circumvent the laws of God, but you are able to now accommodate this person. So you see, this is what I'm saying to you over and over. The lady, the guy left her. All right? She had no control over that. They say to her, you cannot usher anymore. You cannot pray in terms of come up here publicly and lead in prayer. You cannot give no test. You cannot do none of that. In fact, she couldn't even sit in the uh, front area because according to this synagogue of devils, she is in sin because this guy divorced her. So I say, why do you, why do you go, why do you people go to these places? Why? Okay, even when Jesus came up to the woman to the well who had five husbands, did he did he exonerate her? Did he did he expunge her from the things of God? Did he tell her she cannot participate in the things of God? But here it is, these mere mortals, as usual, they come along totally demonically possessed by Satan and his imps and institute rules. Again, here is my problem, though. Why, when she brought her money, why didn't you, you say to her, sweetie, you're a divorced woman. We don't want your $5,000 seat. We don't want your $2,500 you had for the past on pastoral day. Why wasn't she turned down? Why? Why? Why is it that everything else she's exempted from, she cannot participate in it, okay, because she's divorced, but it's only when it comes to the money, devils, demons. That's why I don't listen to them. They are, they are unsaved and pack with demonic imps all up in their brain. That's why I don't listen to a word they say, because they are hypocrites. And if you follow their rules, you are hell bound. You will never prosper. You will never get ahead. Why? Because every choice you make, every decision you make, every right and wrong you try to decipher, it is never based on the rules, the laws, and the protocols of our gracious God. Instead, it is based on some twisted, demented maniac who is hell-bound on controlling people. Have no respect for them. Zero. None at all. Get. None at all. So again, my teachings, all of them, whether it's tithing, whether it's divorce, whether it's the spiritual realm, it is not my aim to sound intelligent or great or whatever. It is my job to do for you what God has done for me through the wisdom that he's given me. And what is that? He has literally released me from the clutches of the conceited, egotistical, self-centered, pompous, arrogant attitudes of men, black men in particular, in black churches, I mean, that's what I'm talking about, black leaders, sorry. Black leaders who just have this demented way. Jesus Christ has given you freedom and liberty. All right? That's that's what it's all about. But it seems as if in these demented synagogue of Satan, when you so-called get saved, you go into another type of bondage under the guise of religion. I know I come out rough tonight, but I just I'm just tired of it. I'm just tired of the hypocrisy. Every time I play that back in my mind, it's just so aggravating. I cannot perform. it. I did nothing wrong. I sing well. I teach well. I do all that. You love that. The person divorced me. And all of a sudden, I'm the devil. All of a sudden, you cannot listen. But you could take my money. You could take my seat. Sonia Trotter, I don't call it ignorance. It is thievery. It is, it is a devil. It is a demon behind that so-called pastor. It is that is not a pastor. He he is a is a is a is a Satanist. And I think I've been too kind here to be honest with you. So again, we are not about that. We are about, like I'm gonna teach you tonight, following what these protocols say, because that is what we want. I want a result. And that's what again made me left the, the four walls in 2012. I wanted results. I was sick of the promises. I was sick of God is going to turn it around. I was sick of the miracle oils. I was sick of their red cloths. I was sick of the Jesus juice. I was sick of the, 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 the Jesus kitten and all this food. I was, I was literally tired of it, tired of it. I was tired of every new year is my year, it's my shift. Uh, I was tired of the riddles and the rhymes. 
So I made a choice. One day I sat back and I don't have to take this. I don't, I don't, I don't care what you call yourself, pastor, master, whatever. I am equally as guilty in sitting here with no results in my life. I should never complain because nobody has me at gunpoint here. I, like the rest, have made the decision to sit here with another round of foolery. 2012 was it for me, buddy. That was it. I, I have had it, and I break loose from that foolishness. And I'm going to teach you tonight what I've been teaching you, exactly, exactly what I did when I left, what I was, what I was doing before I left. And I said that because it was when I was engaging in these things that they were not teaching me that I begin to see changes, just like many of you that follow me. And when I say follow me, follow what I'm teaching, you saw the changes for yourself. And the reason for you seeing these changes is exactly what we're going to talk about tonight. The protocol is the spiritual protocols that manifest God's promises. See, if you're still given seed for miracles, if you're still given seed for car and house and education, then you're not fed up. You haven't arrived at your boiling point. You still got more room to tolerate more nonsense, more foolery, more uh, circus events. That's what it is. You get serious about your faith when you say, you know what? I don't hear nothing else except the word of God. What does the word of God say or has said for me to get what it is I'm seeking? Where do I look in the Bible? To achieve this. But if you're going to depend on everything a person say and never cross check, never read that Bible for yourself, then I cannot blame the Robin stealing, like we say in the Bahamas, the thief and preachers no more. And th of course, what I'm saying is only for those who participate in these demonic activities of misleading the people of God. So this is why now they're watching their children and grandchildren cannot get ahead in life. They never got ahead. Mind you, they were in church all their life. See, I don't know if people think about it, I do, but for me, I don't have any patience when it comes to non-progress. I, I have zero tolerance, zero tolerance to sit in a place, to be under a, a lead, let me be clear, a leader is a super, super failure, super failure, not just a failure, super. All right, when that leader, all right, first of all, you're preaching prosperity, you're preaching success, you're preaching blessings, but none could be seen in your life. What makes it worse is that those who you're preaching it to have equal uh, anti success like you do. And to put the icing on the cake, everyone in there is blind. To what's happening. There's this beautiful passage of scripture. I think it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 4. Paul, in his discourse to the church of Corinth, he says, listen and listen very carefully. He said, if the gospel, which is the good news of Christ, be hid, there's another uh, understanding of the word, or it is not understood. If the gospel of the good news of Christ is, is hid from you or you don't understand it, it's only so because, let me say, because you are lost. What do you mean by that? See, you are lost when you don't have the protocols, when you don't have the rules. You have no guide to go by. You have your complete trust in a human being and not in God himself. So what this person is telling you you're running with. So he said, if you don't understand what your Christian faith is about, if you don't understand what faith is about or, or the things of the spirit, it is only so, this is so powerful, because you are lost, in whom the God of this world, Satan, right, who is the master of the so-called preacher over here, Satan, listen carefully, this is so profound, Satan, who has blinded, listen carefully, not their eyes, you were not going to read that, who has blinded their mind. That's what he did. Satan did not poke their eyes out. Satan did not gorge their eyes out. Their eyes are still there. Their brain is still intact. Their ears are still there. What did he do through this preacher, through this religious leader? He has blinded their mind. 
so that even when one like myself come and teach the truth and show it to you line upon line, look, let's read it. Don't I read it with you? I said, let's go. Now let's read this. The blindness of your mind still say, no, I don't believe that. Or find some fault with Kevin or find some stupid whatever. So it made so much sense to me when I say, how could you not, how could you still stay here in this dungeon, call a church, failure on every end. They're not helping you. They don't assist you. In fact, all they do is condemn you. In fact, you have to sit at the back of this church because the policy is if you're divorced, you can't participate in the events there. But you, you still can give your money though. How? Make me understand how. How could you still buy into that foolishness? I, I just don't get it, all right? So tonight, like I said, spiritual protocols, right? Is what we're looking at because what we want in 2023, no more promise. We've got enough promises to last us six and a half lifetimes. What we want to learn through the scripture, of course, is how do we get the manifestation? How do we get results? How do we get some form of evidence that what we're doing is correct? See, because following the right procedures, such as protocols, it it, it, it it puts a demand on fruit. It puts a demand on the uh, preordained result. See, the purpose of the protocol is God is saying, listen, before time and memorial, before time even began, I've laid out a set of rules, right? And what I did is that I chose different men and women of God, which I have in the Bible, and I used their lives to demonstrate or to put on display my rules. Now, to you, when you read the Bible about a Moses uh, who was put in a little uh, crib, sent down the Nile River, he was picked up by uh, the Pharaoh's daughter, they raised him, blah, blah, blah. To you, it's just a story. But if you truly listen to what's being said, you are going to find in every story, not just the principles and the rules and the policies of God, but in the protocol that manifested the result and victory of a Moses, the result and victory of a Gideon, the result and victory of a Jacob. So it's not just a story. What it is, is a story laced and embedded with protocols that these men and women followed that guaranteed them a positive God intended result. And that is what we're looking for. We don't want no more of your miracle oils. Keep your Jesus juice. We don't want your miracle cupcake and Kool-Aid. Keep all of that. We don't want it. What we want, and I'm sure you guys will agree with me, we want results. We want results. I don't want to hear another preaching on prosperity. I don't want to hear another preaching on God is going to turn it around. I don't want to hear give your neighbor high five, somersault, backflip, pimp slap, drop kick, kung fu somebody. I am not interested in that. If I want to be a part of something like that, I will join a Kung Fu class or I will join the gym. But saying that I'm not interested in that and I want to see the promises of God, then please, for the love of Jesus Christ, give me the protocols that will give me the design intended manifestation of the promises of God. Get out of here with that garbage. Don't want to hear none of that no more. I don't want to hear none of that garbage. Get out of here. All right? So let's get into this tonight. So tonight, we're going to look at some protocols, right? And I want you to go to the book of Proverbs. And the first one we're going to deal with tonight is wisdom. Okay? We're going to deal with wisdom tonight and the importance of it. But then there are certain protocols. So a lot of people, like myself and many others, especially in my earlier walk, there are certain things that you would pray for, such as wisdom, such as understanding, such as Lord direct me. You would pray for these things, and we encourage people to pray for them. And the truth is, a lot of these things you do not have to pray for. No. What do you mean, Kevin? You mean we shouldn't ask God for this? No, I'm not saying you shouldn't ask for it. But like I'm going to show you right now, there are certain protocols that will produce wisdom, that will produce understanding, that will produce knowledge, if you follow these simple rules. What this teaching is going to teach you also tonight or show you tonight is that there are many situations that you decided to vie for witchcraft. What do you mean, Kevin? You decided 
that this clown up here says, give me this money and God is going to give you wisdom. Give me this amount of seed and I see God raining down the understanding. Well, let's look at some scriptures. Let's look at some scriptures tonight. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 1, okay? And let's look at verse 7, all right? All right, listen to this. Talking about knowledge in this case. The fear of the Lord. So let's stop right there because we want to make sense of the scriptures. Because if we're going to follow a protocol or a particular procedure or regulation, then we must understand it in its full context so that when we participate in it, we participate with boldness and confidence and assurity that I'm definitely going to get what hinges on the end of this protocol or the promise that hinges on the end of this protocol. So the Bible says here in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the fear the reverence, the respect of the Lord, listen, is the beginning of knowledge. Mm, that's interesting. Did he say you have to pray for it? No, I didn't read that. Help me here now. We're looking at protocols. We're looking at protocols. we got to change our whole way of doing things in 2022, 2021, and going all the way back there. Forget all of that. Let's come to what the Bible says. Did you read just now? And again, I'm not saying don't pray for, for knowledge, but let's look at what the scriptures actually say. The Bible is saying here, if you're interested in knowledge, it's going to begin with you having fear, which simply means reverence, reverential fear for God, meaning that I honor you so I will do the things that you require of me or what you ask me to do. So he says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So, so starting off with, with sorry, knowledge. So for knowledge, I must fear God. Now, why is that important? Because there are certain things excuse me, we are required to do by Christ. For example, I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself, but I'm just going to say this here. Uh, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. He talks about the law of prosperity and success. What did he say? And this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate upon it day and night. And then, now did he say you must pray day and night? Did he say that? Did he say you must fast day and night? No, didn't he say that? Did he say you must give a seed day and night? No, you didn't read that. How did God tell you? Because remember now, based on the demonic, uh, uh, demonically saturated prosperity gospel, you got to give money, give seed, give seed, give seed. But according to Joshua 1 and 8, he said, this here is the spiritual protocol. And anyone who's telling you anything contrary to this is a devil. He said that you must meditate on the word of God, what? Day and night. Then shall you be prosperous. Then shall you have success. So you see, protocol is following a set of rules, a set of laws, a set of regulation. It is the procedure that I follow to get the promise that hinges at the end of this protocol. See, when you understand it that way, you, 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 you get away from the hocus pocus, the hype, the shouting, the screaming, the flipping, the back soul, the high five, and all the guitar playing and the beating of the drums and the, all of that foolishness because none of it is including the protocols. It is getting me hyped to now give something to replace the protocols, but to get that same promise. The devil is a liar. The devil is, get out of here, get out of here, get with that foolishness. So coming back here now to Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7, he says, now if you're interested in the knowledge of God, you must fear God first. The fear of the Lord, verse 7 of Proverbs 1, is the beginning or the initiation of knowledge. But listen, but fools despise wisdom and what instructions. Meaning, I don't want to hear that, Kevin. If I ain't given a seed to my pastor or, or breaking off some pastoral offering of you to get blessings, then I don't want to hear it because everything else is just too difficult. So you see, he says, because the God of this world has blinded their who? Their what? Their mind, not their eyes, their mind. Satan grab a hold. He's controlling that mind. Resist the word of God. Don't follow the word of God. Look for the easy way out. Look where you could sow a seed. Look where you could bribe your pastor or give this to your apostle. And who give, uh, uh, oh, how it go now? With the prophet reward. Let, let, let's use scripture that is totally out of context. No, the fear 
It's a protocol. The fear of the Lord. And again, this is not to mean to be afraid of God. It means to God, I, for example, I, I, I fear my marriage. What that means is that I respect my marriage, that I don't want to step out on Deidre. I don't want to embarrass her or me. I don't want to bring shame to our relationship. So when I say I fear our marriage, it simply means that I honor, I reverence, I respect what we have. Hence, my behavior will now demonstrate this reverence. So if I say I fear God, then, hey, this guy is praying all the time. This guy is reading the word. But more importantly, aside from the praying, aside from the reading, he is a doer and a committed, constant doer of the word of God. He isn't putting on a show when he get in church, flipping about somersaulting, drop kicking the preachers, beating up the, the, the band members. No, this guy is coming here or she, I'm coming here to, I don't want, listen, pastor better preach sense today because I'm coming here to get a set of instructions because that's what the Bible is. It's a book of instructions. It's a book of protocols. And that is what we have not been putting a demand on. We love entertainment. We love it. We love the God said, uh, and he said, uh, and he said, uh. where are the rules? Where is the protocol? Where are the instructions? There are none because they don't know none. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge protocol. If you're seeking for knowledge, begin by reverencing and respecting the God of Abraham. But fools despise, they hate wisdom and instructions. They want nothing to do with it. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. All right? Let's go to Proverbs chapter 2. I'm going to read verse 6 and verse 7. I love it. Listen. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Listen. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Who is wisdom coming from? God. Out of his mouth, listen, listen, come at knowledge. Hmm. Hmm. This makes a lot of sense to me. The Bible says it is God that will give wisdom, right? Because so, so the Bible is trying to get you to understand where the origin of wisdom is coming from. That's the first thing it want to make clear to you. All right. Then it says to you, watch this now, the Lord give it wisdom, but the Lord give it wisdom, sorry, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Mm, but God, I don't have a Kevin, I'm gonna be real with you. I don't hear the voice of God. I don't. I don't hear the voice. Which means you don't hear the voice of God. Yeah, because you know, I have pastor those given testimony, and they talk about how they the spirit told this to them, and the Holy Spirit said this, and the Holy Spirit said, Don't go left, but go right. And one voice came to them and they said that make this particular I say, let me, let me, let me, cut all that garbage out, cut that nonsense out right here. Stop complicating it. Every, listen to me carefully. Every time you hear the scriptures, the Bible. The chapters, the verses, you are hearing the voice of God. So let's keep our finger right here. I'm going to come right back here, okay? Quickly, let's go to Psalms. I like to prove my point. Let's go to Psalms 103. You all know where I'm going with this. Psalms 103, and let's look at verse 20. Let's look at verse 20. What does it say? Psalms 103, verse 20, in correlation as to, the Bible says that knowledge, and, and I think uh, understanding, comes out of the mouth of God. But some say, well, Kevin, I don't hear the physical voice of God. I don't hear this audible voice everybody's be talking about. I hear people talking about the Holy Spirit telling them this and that. I never hear no holy voice, and I never hear no voice internally. Okay, well, let's look at Psalms 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, uh -huh, that excel in strength. So the subject is still who? The angels. That do his commandments. Who's doing the commandments? The angels. And what are the commandments? The laws, the rules, the regulations of God that I constantly teach you. Now, watch what else these angels do. These angels hearken, hearken unto what? The voice of his word. Hmm. So the scriptures is telling us that when we hear the word of God, no matter who is speaking it, no matter who is decreeing it, when you hear, uh, great is he that is in me than he did his world. When you hear, uh, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. When you hear, uh, the Lord shall bless the righteous and with favor shall he encompass them about. When you hear the Lord is my shepherd, no matter who is coming from, whether it's a record player, whether it's a human being, according to what we just read, it says that it is the voice of his word. It is God's voice. It is God speaking through this person, through this record player, through the CD player. So I don't need to go into hocus pocus line. Oh, oh. 
Hallelujah. I hear the Spirit say. No, I hear the Bible say. Because when I hear the Bible, I hear the voice of the living God. Get out of here. Get. Not tonight. See, cut the hocus pocus. Cut trying to be all spiritual and all deep. We don't need that. Why you think when you woke up this morning, there was a scripture that came to you or a particular song, a, a gospel song with a, with a biblical verse in it? Why is it that when you was driving, you hear this particular scripture that was quoted on the gospel station and it would not leave you? It is the voice of the living God. And what is the voice of the Lord trying to do according to Proverbs 2 verses 6 and 7? It says, out of his mouth, whose mouth? God's mouth. Comes what? Knowledge and understanding. You play with me. I want to hear this. I, I'm tired of the hocus pocus. I am tired of the clownery. Everyone trying to be so deep. Let's just read the Bible and listen to the voice of God. Oh, God, don't speak to me. I agree with you because you don't read the Bible. And you don't want to hear nothing God have to say to you through his word. Get out of here. So let's go back here now to Proverbs chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Protocols. That's what we're looking at. Spiritual protocols to give us a predetermined promise. So in Proverbs 2, verses 6 says, For the Lord give it wisdom. How? How does he give it? It says, Out of his mouth. And how does he speak out of his mouth? The voice. Whenever we hear the word of God, it's the voice of God. It says, Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and who? Understanding. So what was the initial protocol in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7? He says, The fear of the Lord. The reverencing of him, the respect of him, it, 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 it is the beginning of knowledge. So now when somebody says, I hear God say, there's some people in here who lack knowledge, glory be to Jesus. And I hear God say, he said, this night, right now, run up here right now. Come right now. Don't you even let the devil use you. Walk up here right now and sow a seed for this knowledge. Now, if you're following what I'm saying to you, you should sit right back and say, no, no, this, this dude is a clown. The only thing this nigga, sorry, the only thing this dude missing is a red nose right now. That's it. Because Kevin just showed us the protocol for wisdom, for knowledge, for understanding. And none of it required a seed. None of it required purchasing a vial of oil. None of it required a special cloth. None of it, none of that. So again, what am I saying to you? Don't come into 2023 still playing hopscotch, still playing these spiritual, foolish, demonic games. What does the Bible say? How does the Bible, what is the protocol given to us to achieve the promises of God? What does it say? How much longer are you going to go? doing the same foolish events, the same spiritual gymnastic to get the same result. And what is that result? God getting ready to make something happen for you again. You're right. You're God, the God of this world. So the Bible says, for the Lord give it wisdom. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 67. Out of his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He lay it up. Listen, I love this. I love this. I love this. He, who is this he? God. He lay it up, not just any kind of wisdom. The Bible says he lay up sound wisdom to a specific person. Listen, he lay it up sound wisdom for the who? For the righteous. Now, in order to understand this protocol, we must understand or what is the meaning of righteous. Righteous simply means, and I say this to you all the time, the God way of doing things. If God says, do not lie, you will not lie, you are living righteous. If God says, do not steal, and you are not stealing, you are living righteous. If God says, love your wife like Christ loved the church, and you're doing that, you are living righteous. So the Bible says, for those who place emphasis on living according to the will of God or what God uh, has ordained, the Bible says, God has laid up. He has put in storage, not just any kind of wisdom, but sound wisdom for that particular righteous person. I want to hear the rules. I want to hear the laws. I want to hear the protocols. I want to hear how I can get... Don't tell me I can get the car if I do this. Don't tell me if I can get the house. Don't tell me I can get the husband. Show me God's rules. In other, way, in other words, show me the righteous way of achieving this. Don't show me the, the demonic way by uh, selling oil 
and, and turning the church into some kind of flea market. Show me what the rules say, and you got my attention. I came here to hear the word of God. I came here to hear. There's some things that I'm going through. There's some things that I'm battling with. I've tried it every other way. It didn't work. Now that I understand spiritual laws and protocols, spiritual instructions, spiritual regulations, preacher, please, for the love of Christ, tell me what the instructions of the holy book say so I can follow that because that's what I want to follow. He laid up sound wisdom. For the righteous. He is a buckler to them. I love it. That walk uprightly. Or that walk in righteousness. Or in other words, that walk according to his will. Meaning, how I've instructed you. Kevin, I have told you, do not send evil prayers against sender. Don't do that. Bless those that curse you. Pray for those that despitefully use you and say all manner of things against you. Kevin, what, are, what, what am I doing when I do it that way? You are walking uprightly. You are living righteously. And are there promises for the righteous? Yes. And one of them we just read, God has secured, God has put aside, God has isolated just for you, not any kind of wisdom, but sound wisdom for who? For the righteous. No, you mean for the one who's selling it for seed? No, 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 no. You mean for the one who exchanged it for miracle oil? No, 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 no. For the one who says, take this red cloth or take this pink towel or pimp slap your pastor or whatever. No. Who is it being stored for? It is being stored for the one that will walk uprightly, or the one who live in righteousness, Lehman's term, the one who is doing according to the word of God. Very simple. Very simple. Proverbs chapter 10, let's look at verse, sorry, Proverbs chapter 2, let's look at verse 10 and 11. Listen, more, more nuggets. Listen, he says, now, remember what we started out with, Proverbs 1 verse 7, and it says that the beginning of what? Sorry, the fear of the Lord is the beginning or the initiator of knowledge. We just read in Proverbs chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, in great detail, okay, that uh, it is God that giveth wisdom and out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. And then he said in verse 7 that he says that he has set aside sound wisdom for who? For a specific group, because it ain't for everybody, for the righteous. Now, in verse 10 and 11, he becomes even more detailed in these protocols. Listen to what he says. In Proverbs 2, verse 10, he says, Now, when wisdom cometh, so this is now going to be the evidence. How, Kevin, how in the name of Jesus am I going to know that I have the wisdom of God? Watch this now. When wisdom entered into thine heart, mm -hmm, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. Uh-huh. Watch what's going to happen in verse 11. Discretion shall preserve thee. What is discretion? Making the right decisions. Discerning what is right and wrong. And picking the right way to do it based on the laws, the rules of God. See, why this is important to learn? Because if you go all your life believing that sowing seeds to get the promises of God is the way out, what is going to happen when you get in a jam in life? Are you going to say, oh my God, where do I sow a seed? As opposed to, let me follow the protocol of God. So he says, when wisdom entered into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion, I love it. Making the right decisions, in other words, shall preserve thee or keep thee or guard thee. Listen, understanding now shall keep thee. Verse 12, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the way that speaketh forward things. Now, this here, I just hate giving these, but I got to give it. This here is a part of my teaching in marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And in this part, I'm going to be speaking, especially women, but it's for men also, that a lot of you are out there and you say, Lord, I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to suffer divorce like a Kevin or anybody else. I want to do it the right way to the first go round. So he just told you how to do it. He says, when wisdom and knowledge and understanding, once you have, big, have really incorporated that, into your cerebral cortex, into your being. You truly depending on the word of God and the decisions you're going to make now is going to be based on the protocols. He says here, when wisdom entered into your heart and knowledge is pleasant to thy soul, discretion shall preserve you. 
You know what the word preserve means? It means to keep something fresh, to keep it alive. So what that mean now, when these jokers coming up, but oh, you know, Sister Mary, I've been watching you for a while, and you know I'm a Christian, you know I'm an apostle to the third power, to the tenth dimension of the 14 Galaxy Foundation, and I'm just filled with the anointing of God, and God been speaking to me. You ain't listening to none of that. The Spirit of the Lord that is literally working in you through you, gorging on the Word of God. You are filled with His wisdom. You are filled with His knowledge. So now you could discern, because you're not looking at callers, you're not looking at titles and all of these foolishness. He's just riddling off. you just looking straight through this, this clown, straight through. But what was the prerequisite for you to be able to do that? You had to get acquainted with the rules, with the protocols, with the spiritual laws. So I'm trying to help you. You don't have to be a statistic like me. See, I, I, I am very transparent. I ain't hide nothing. Nobody can keep me in no corner, but he was divorced before. He can't preach. He can't. Well, that on you, bro. For those of you who got sense and who want to listen to wisdom and experience, get acquainted with God law. Do the best you could to follow it. And I'm telling you, your, not only your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding will, will increase, but your de decision-making will be profound. In fact, when you see the results of your decision, you yourself is going to say, I, can't, I don't even know why I even made that choice. And that is when you're going to realize it is the spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit, the one whom he has promised, that will constantly lead you into all truth. I don't care how much car they roll up on. I don't care how much position they got. I don't care how much money they have. I don't care how much education. The spirit is going to be, the spirit of the living God through your eyes is going to be like an x-ray. Forget x-ray, like an MRI. And you could see all the flaws in this clown. You could see the lies and the deceit. The spirit of the living Lord will even show you the future that if you go and mess around with this joker, what your life is going to be like. You don't need no crystal ball for that. You need the spirit of truth that comes through the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of knowledge. I'm trying to help you. This year, 2023, we don't want to hear it no more. Save the drama for your mama. We don't want to hear none of that foolishness. We don't want to hear no rhymes, no riddles. We don't want to hear God is getting ready to do this. We don't want to hear no breaking down of nothing to come to some ideology opinion. We, preacher, the only thing we want to hear from you, whatever you're talking about, give us the rules. That's it. We ain't stupid. If you give us the rules, we'll take it from there. In fact, we don't even need you no more. Give me. We, you, you, you think you're talking about marriage, preacher? You're talking about finances, preacher? You're talking about prosperity? I have no problem with that. Could you kindly give us the godly rules to attain it? Because we understand now. There are because life is spiritual, there are spiritual laws, there are spiritual rules, there are spiritual protocols, there are spiritual regulation. That when I follow them, and this is what God has put in, in him, this is his rules, this is his word. So until you give me that preacher, boy, you're talking to the wind. You weren't talking to me. You weren't talking to me. You couldn't be talking to me because I, I will see change. I will see breakthrough. And not only do I want to see my breakthrough, I want to break it in my life. And now I want to intercede for my children and teach them so now they could break this thing and go forward the way that God had ordained without these hindrances and delays, all because we sub excuse me, subscribe to tradition. Get out of here. If you ain't giving me that word, you and listen, you will cause us fight, preacher. Go sit down. If you ain't coming with that word, go get safe. Because clearly you're not. Clearly you're not. So now we're going to jump on another one. Again, I'm just, just going all over to show you just protocols. And we're going to look at a protocol called recompense. And you guys know what the word recompense means, right? It means for you to be uh, reimbursed of the uh, losses that you've suffered. So let's go here now to Proverbs uh, chapter 11, and we're going to look at uh, verse 31. Proverbs 11, Proverbs 11, verse 31. <laughs> Proverbs 11, verse 31. <laughs> I tell you. So listen, Proverbs 11, verse 31, again. L listen to this promise. It says here, it says, Behold, or the word means to see. See the righteous. Circle that word because, again, when you're following protocols, you now got to look at who specifically is this for? Is this for everybody involved or is this for a specific group? And this is how you get to learn to understand the Bible. For example, there's some promise in the, promises in the Bible that are only 
for the saints only. If you are not a, you have accepted Jesus Christ, you do not qualify for the promises that he has given. And in cases, some cases you'll see that. And then there are other cases where there's a general rule for anybody who participates. For example, we talk about uh, Psalms 41 verses 1 to 3. And it says, blessed is he. Put inverted commas on he, because he is generic of everyone, man, woman, child, anyone. Blessed is he that considered the poor. So anyone who considered the poor, those seven promises, God will hook them up. It doesn't matter what lifestyle you're in. They could be gay, a thief, a murderer. It does not matter. God put this in his promise. And then again, this is what this does too. It now branches off in that scripture that says that uh, God shines on the just and the unjust. And this is a clear example of it where he's giving you an opportunity. He's not looking at your spiritual state and in this regard. He says, if you follow this protocol and rule, if you consider the poor, I will do these things for you. In the case here of recompense in Proverbs 11, verse 31, he says, behold, the righteous, watch this now, shall be recompensed in the earth. This is such a beautiful promise. Because what this is saying to me that no matter what my losses were in life, God is saying to you, I'm going to recompense you. Again, I, I just hate doing it, but I got to do it because I got, I got so much stuff packed for my teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. This scripture is going to speak to it too because what people are saying to you, if you cannot get married again, and again, it's all going to be based on that particular situation according to scripture, is saying here, this scripture don't exist and this, this, this is a no-no. So if your husband pick up and leave you and go on and do what he want to do and go on and marry somebody else and your church is say, well, you can't get married no more. And again, it all depends on the situation because there are specific rules and guidelines depending on that situation according to scripture. So, so what they're saying to you is Proverbs 11 verse 31a does not apply to you. God is not going to recompense you. God is not going to reimburse you for your losses then. That's what they're saying to you. But this is not what the scripture is saying. So this is why I tell you, and I cannot put emphasis on it enough, read the Bible for yourself. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you, teach you, give you revelation. Because if you follow, even me, even if I'm telling it to you, go and read it for yourself. Father, I hear Kevin, and it really sounds good, but God, please, confirm of what he's saying is true. I'm not offended. I encourage that. I want you to do that. Don't let nobody feel as if they got the, 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 the monopoly on the scriptures, because nobody does. All right? So the scripture says, behold, the righteous shall be recompensed. And again, I love to use myself as an example. And I told you my story. I lost everything, everything I lost, everything. Apartment complex, property, wife, everything I lost, moved back home. You know my story. At the age of 40 years old, a 40-year-old man had to move back with his mother. Save Christian. I had no control over my losses, absolutely none, zero. But guess what? I never gave up on what I believe. I believe the word of God. And now I am living today because I, God has recompensed me in every area of my life, including marriage. Now, there's some of you are listening, well, that is not of God. Sweetie, sir, that's you. Whatever you believe, you run with that. You run with what you, if that's where you are, stick right there in the corner. But I can tell you one thing, you can never keep Kevin L.A. Ewing back. God has blessed me abundantly. God has catapulted me beyond my wildest imagination. When I was praying for one, two, and three, he was way up in the thousands, the hundred thousand. He was just blessing. And I'm not talking finances. I'm talking about me leaping from place to place. Why? Because I followed the protocol and not the opinion of men. And I encourage people and many of you out there who have been divorced, who who got married, whatever it is you did in life. And we can speak more about that on Saturday. But God is a God of his word and I am living proof of it. And this is why I reiterate my testimony repeatedly. No preacher, no teacher, no pastor, no apostle could tell me otherwise because I am living the manifestation of following the protocol of God's word. I told you before, it was only when I stopped praying against my enemies, when I stopped sending prayers back to sender, that's when God began to work for me. And it all made sense when he gave me the revelation. Kevin, follow my protocol. I never told you to curse the enemy. I said to bless them. Bless them that curse you. 
pray for those that despitefully use you. It was then when I did that, things shift for me. Things shift. So I don't care what nobody tell me. They could never, ever get me to go against my Jesus. So listen, behold the righteous, Proverbs 11 verse 31, shall, not might, shall be recompensed. So in other words, he's saying it's guaranteed. This is nothing to debate. So the righteous would be the one who's walking uprightly or the one who's walking to or doing things the way God wanted to be done. So this person is guaranteed there's going to be return. A return. God is, listen, God is going to re recompense you. God is going to reimburse you. But Kevin, I can't see it right now. I don't have a job. I five months back in my rent. In fact, they're coming to take me out tomorrow. That may be true. They may even kick you out. But you see, you're basing the future on right now. No, 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 no. Recompense, meaning that you will receive of the losses you suffered. It coming. So he said, the righteous shall be recompensed. In right? Listen, listen. Much more, still the law of recompense, much more the wicked and the sinner. So he's saying the wicked and the sinner, when recompense come for them, for the evil that they have dished out, he is saying here, according to biblical principle, this is not my rules, they will receive more in return of the wickedness than they dished out. I love it. I love it. So God says, stop praying against them. When they decided to do evil, they had no idea that they engaged a law that is going to work grievously against themselves. In other words, do not pray against them. Do not fight them. Do not challenge them. Do not go tit for tat, butter for fat. You kill their dog, you kill their cat. Why? Because when the God of all righteousness come to judge, he got to judge you the same way he's judging them. Because you were no different from them. That's why I can say to you again, stop sending prayers back to sender, talking foolishness. Stop talking. People always come to me, but Kevin, I don't be sending it back to the person. I send it to the pits of hell, didn't send no curses after you. Humans did. So rather than trying to differentiate whether you send it back to the devil, the demons, the pits of hell, or humans, he says, bless those that curse you. I don't know why you're trying to create your own rules. Bless those that curse you. Very simple. And pray, pray for them that despitefully use you and saying all kinds of things about you on the job, in the family, whatever. He never say, oh, send the case back to the devil. Send the case back to Apollyon. Send you, why are you making up your own rules? There are no promises at the end of your own rules. The promises are hinged to the protocols of God. So get out of here, that garbage. Nobody listen to that foolishness. Get out of here. So there are protocols even when it comes to peace. Again, I'm teaching you how to read your Bible, how to understand your Bible. Life is spiritual. Therefore, God aided us with a spiritual book with spiritual protocols to give us the spiritual promises to manifest in the physical realm. So now we're going to look at peace. A lot of you don't have that. You came straight out of 2022 into 2023, sorry, riddled with anxiety. Riddled with fear, phobias, all right? You've been sowing seed trying to get rid of it. I don't know what rule you could lead me to that says if you sow a seed, God is going to remove your fear. I never read it. Let's really see what the good book says about this. So let's go. Let's look at a few of them. Let's go to Psalms. Let's go to the book of Psalms. I'm going to look at 119 division of Psalm. And we're going to look at uh, verse 165. I love this one. Listen to what it says. Great, circle that word. Great peace. So right out the back, he's not speaking about your average peace. Great peace. Listen, have they that love thy who? I didn't hear that. That love thy what? Thy law. Not seed, not miracle oil, not miracle juice, not blowing shofars, not putting spiritual scarf around your face. That can't give me peace. Because I read no scripture that says that if I blow this or I sing this or if I flip and kung fu this, I will get peace. Let's do it the way the Bible say do it. He says, great peace have they which love thy law. That sounds like you, Kevin. And what's going to happen? And nothing shall offend them. My God. You all, you all listen to this? You all hearing this, right? Is this only in my Bible? God, how do I get great peace? Well, some will tell you, you got to pray for great peace. Come on, glory, hallelujah. You got to pray. Come on, pray right now. Pray hard. Say, God, give me great peace. God, give me great peace. Now tell Jesus you love him. I love you, Jesus. Now say, give me great peace. No, I'm not going to say that, lion preacher. I'm going to follow 
these rules because I need to get the results. And I cannot implement your ideology. I cannot implement your rules and expect the promises of God to come. I was never told to pray for great peace. What did it say? It says, I will have great peace if I love the laws, the rules, the principles, the ordinance, the precepts, the commands of the living God. That's what I'm reading. What are you reading? What are you reading? I'm listening. Get mad all you want, buddy. It's the rules. You get mad at the scriptures, not me. The scriptures are unequivocally clear. How do I attain? I want to know. That's why I tell you, preacher, I'm putting a demand on you this year. If you can't give me the rules, shut up. I don't want to hear your fancy preaching. I don't want to hear your verb and predicate. I don't want to hear none of that. Don't You ain't got to cross no T's and dot no I's. All I simply ask, whatever you're going to preach to me, particularly as it relates to God giving me something, for the love of Christ, please give me the instructions or the protocols or the regulation as prescribed by Scripture. That's what I'm asking. I don't think that's difficult at all. Give me exactly what the, because I want to follow that. So he's telling me here in Psalms 119 verse 165, he says, Kevin, hear me and hear me well. If you want, not regular peace, Kevin. If you want great peace, then here is what you do. Fall in love with my word. And not only will you get great peace, when you love my word, Kevin, the evidence of this great peace, nothing shall offend you. Mighty God. You all listen to this? You all hear this? You all hear this? The Bible is giving me the protocol. The Bible is giving me the procedure. The Bible is giving me the instructions. What does the Bible say about instructions? We're going to come right back here. Let's look at some more scripture. We're coming right back here. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 4. I love it. Proverbs chapter 4. And let's look at verse 13. Let's watch how powerful instructions. These instructions fall under procedures, under protocols, all of the one and the same. So Proverbs 4 verse 13, he says, take fast hold. Don't do it slowly. He said quickly. Take fast hold of who? Instruction. He says, let her not go. Don't let it escape you. Don't let the rule you just heard that if you love God's word, that should be the emphasis. When you love his word, you will have great peace. That's instructions. So he says, grab that. Don't let it go. Repeat it day and night. Repeat it, repeat it. Get involved in it. Let it become a part of your life. Put emphasis on doing the word of God. Take fast hold of instructions. Let her not go. Keep all. Now, this is the part I love. Why? Why is all this emphasis on instruction? He says, for she, because he has personified instruction in the female gender, for she is thy life. Well, what is this? You all hear this? You all hear this? You all hear this? Did you all hear this? Kevin, why are you saying it like that? Because if the man is preaching everything except the instruction, he don't care about my life. Because if the Bible says, this is my life, okay, in so much word, the Bible is saying, this is your life support. If you take this life support off of you, you're going to die. So he's saying to you that the instructions of God is your life support. And if, you're, if you don't have one of these life support attached to you, you will not live. So if the preacher is preaching riddles, if the preacher is supplementing the word of God with money, if the preacher is giving me everything except the word of God, then why are we shocked that there is no manifestations in here? Why isn't anybody getting ahead? Why is generational curses rampant in this church? Why the pastor always broke and can't get ahead in life and always need money for this and begging the members? Well, let me see. He took away your and his life support by keeping the word of God away from you. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. I am trying to help you. Scripture, not my opinion. The Bible begs us repeatedly and gives several analogies. It says, grab hold of instruction. Keep her. For she is thy life. The instructions and the way God set it out in this word 
was not for you or your pastor to change it or to alter it or to give your version, interpretation, or ideology or new sub clauses to it. If you are not following it the way that he laid it out in scripture, then you are a fool to believe you will receive the promises attached at the end of this protocol. It'll never happen. It will never in this life happen. All right? So he says in Psalms 119, verse 165, great peace, not your average peace. Great peace have they that do who? That love, not like, you didn't see the word like, that love, who, like Kevin, he loved the word. Great peace have they that love thy word and who and nothing, I love it. So he's telling me that the, 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 the evidence, I love it, the evidence that I have attained or achieved great peace through the love of the word of God the evidence would be no matter what people do, say, or whatever, I will never be offended by it. Well, mighty God, I love it. I love it. Let's go look at another one. Let's look at Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26, verse 3. I love this one. Listen, not a protocol. Listen, not a promise. Thou will keep him. Mm -hmm. I love it. I want you to circle the word him because we're coming back there. Thou will keep him in perfect peace. Listen, that's the catch now. It's a protocol whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. So God keeping you in perfect, meaning complete peace. So don't get better than this. That's not going to happen because you say so or because you ask for it to happen. There, there's a protocol to get this particular promise, this complete peace. He said he will keep you in perfect peace if your mind is stayed on thee. If I'm meditating on the word day and night. Now, let's, let's bring this baby home. How is it that I came into 2023 laden down with anxiety? I am even more fair, and I'm just using an example, not me. I'm even, or you're more fearful now because you just learned your cousin died the other day. You just learned a colleague was killed in a motorcycle accident. All of these strange things are happening. Now, this is only on top of you coming out of 22, already feeling as if you're going to die soon or you're not going to have enough money to accommodate your lifestyle in the future or what if you lose your car, all of these thoughts. Well, let's see what you are doing and what you're not doing. In a case like that, fear has gotten the better part of you or whatever's running away with your mind is because your mind is not saturated with God. It's saturated with evil thoughts, evil um, scenarios. So you're thinking and meditating day and night more about the negative things in life than what the scriptures have been telling you all along. So God says, I could give you perfect peace, but it has to be an exchange. So here's what I want you to do. Keep your mind on me and trust in me. And as a result of this, it will manifest or even produce not just any kind of peace, but what? Perfect or complete peace in your life. I'm trying to help somebody. I'm trying to help you. Put a demand on your preacher. If your preacher's not preaching the word of God, get out of that church. Leave. Leave. It's a synagogue of dead people. Get out of there. Get out. You cannot be there another day listening to the same rubbish, but no instructions. You need instructions because you need to follow the instructions to get the promises that is attached to those instructions. So he says he will keep you in perfect peace as long as your mind is stayed upon thee. All right? So let's go to Genesis now. I want to give you a scripture tonight. Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 6. And what is this one we're looking at now? We're looking at the law of unity or the law of synergy. Now, the law of unity, because it's a law, because it's a rule, it will work for good or it will work for bad. All right? This law, as you know, some of you know already, I'll be using this extensively in my teaching on uh, marriage, divorce and remarriage, the law of synergy. Because if you don't have synergy before you get married, you are getting involved in pure trouble, pure misery. Don't let people tell you because he saved and you save, then that's all you need and you can get married. It is utter garbage, utter garbage. In some cases, if that's how you're thinking, it'll be better you marry a sinner man. See, gone are the days when the qualifier is I am I'm, I'm saved. 
you know I speak in tongues, right? Yeah, Chinese too. Yeah, I do that too, yeah. Uh-huh. Spit out a few prophecies here and there. And I like it. I think we should get married. Mm. So now they come. Oh, you should be equally yoked. So to them, equally yoked simply means this. This is how they interpret it. Equally yoked mean you save and I save. People of God, how many people do you know? How many people do you know who were saved and divorced today? So clearly, that wasn't the only qualifier to, to uh, qualify want to be equally yoked. And I've been saying this for years, all right? And I know a famous preacher who I love, I listen to all the time, and he made a statement one time that I will never, ever agree to. He made that same statement. He said, as long as you are safe and the other party is safe, you could marry that person. That is not true. And again, this is one of the pillows that my teaching is going to be based on. God had a plan for your life before the foundation of the world. He has equipped you with all spiritual blessings, including your spouse, before the foundation of the world. So you're telling me God had a whole plan for your life, excluding marriage? See, what happened when you tell people that this is what they, this is what they get into their cerebral? When I say to someone, listen, God has already... Before you were even born, God already have your person. That's that. Just like he would have had the home for you, the education, just like how he would assign you to a specific family, this is all in place. There is no arbitrarily nothing here with God. So you can go through life and say, okay, God have a plan for, being, for me to be married, for, sorry, for me to be uh, safe. God have a plan for me to get a good job. God have a plan for me to have good health. But when it comes to marriage, he just leaves you to go on your own. Go pick who you feel like picking. No, 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 no. And that is where we go wrong. Especially when the person says, well, you know, uh, I was saved for 10 years now. And, you know, and the Lord spoke to me. And I saw you in a dream. And, and you know, and then I saw this tree and this yellow angel coming. And I knew that man, we must be married. See, that voodoo, we be done with that. Be done because many of you listening to me right now, listen to me right now and say, Boy, Kevin, I wish I was, I wish I heard you five, 10, 15 years ago, yeah, because that's just what this clown came with. You see, remember what I said to you about the protocols to knowledge. Remember what I told you, right? And the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And in Proverbs 2, verses 6 and 7, he talks about how uh, it is God that given wisdom and out of his mouth. Uh, give it uh, knowledge and understanding. We drop down to verse 10 and 11. What he says, he says, he now gives us the evidence of when you would have secured spiritual knowledge, wisdom and understanding, because that's what it is, the spiritual. He says, discretion shall keep thee. Look up that word. Discretion, decision, you, you will be making, you will now make the best decisions in life because you are in alignment with the word of God. The, the, the Listen, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will send the Holy Spirit or the comforter. And listen, his primary role. His primary role is to lead us. So we should be following him. Leading us into what? All truth. Not, not every other truth except who you're supposed to connect with in life. He didn't leave you on your own. He says, okay, the same Holy Spirit is responsible for leading you to who I have ordained for you to be with before the foundation of the world. Now, here's what the problem is. People believe God is being a bully. He's not being a bully. I could choose a particular car for my son. I always had this for him. He don't have to pick what I choose for him. He still has a choice. And this is where people get hooked up because they think God is dictating to them. No, I chose this for you, Kevin. I chose this particular job. I chose this particular uh, church for you to go to. I, these are the things that was in my plan for your life. Kevin, I'm not going to force this woman on you. Kevin, I'm not going to force this job on you. Kevin, I'm not going to force salvation on you. You still have your own free will. But let me be clear with you, Kevin. I don't ever want you to believe because you let some preacher, this controller, tell you who to marry. You marry them and they became a living help for you, okay? Having all kinds of children on you, disrespecting you. And now you come back crying, Lord, I wish I had listened to you. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying to you, knowing what you know now, based on our teachings, Father, it is clear to me. I've been doing things my way. I've been, 
I thought I was being spiritual. I thought that I was connecting the dots by saying, I like this person. And guess what? They're safe. And I figured that means that was all green light go. But now, Father God, I realized that even Satan could use another believer to mislead me, to take me on the wrong path, to cause me to be connected to something that will never produce. In fact, it will put me in a worse position than where I was when I was single. So, Father, because you have a plan for my life, and it is not excluding marriage or any other big ticket item, Father, let the spirit of truth lead me into all truth. Let the spirit of truth guide me to that job, guide me to that husband, guide me to that wife, guide me to the car you want me to have, even down to the clothes you want me to get. I want to be open for this. I don't want to be a fanatic, but I want to be in tune. I want to be submissive and obedient to the spirit of truth whose primary purpose is to guide me into all truth. Again, if the preacher isn't giving me the word of God, he isn't giving me truth. I don't want to hear from him. I have nothing to say to him. I will hear nothing from him. Because it was because of his riddles and rhymes and nursery rhymes that put many of you on the wrong path. I want to hear the spirit of truth. That's what I want to hear. What does God have to say about this? So let's go to the synergy. Genesis chapter 11 verse 6. Again, the background to the story, I love it, I love it, is about the Tower of Babel, all right? This evil hedonistic group led by King Nimrod, the first king of the earth. Okay, when the Bible never called him a king, it said that he had a kingdom. You cannot have a king without a kingdom, nor could you have a kingdom without a king. So based on that evidence, because I followed the evidence, he was a king. And he led this group of men, and these men were totally into the to, to, to esoterics and and metaphysicists and all that occultic stuff. And they say they want to build a tower that reach into the heavens. They want people to see what God do it. And God never stopped them. But it was, became so interesting what it was doing. God says, let us, let's go Holy Spirit. Let's go Jesus. Let us go down and see what these jokers doing. And after God see how they were all on one accord, all moving about in harmony, God now began to reveal or, or release the protocol of unity or the protocol of synergy, synergy where two or more people come together to produce more collectively than they were doing as individuals. In other words, there were 15 rocks ready in front of me and each of these rocks weigh 55 pounds. If I try to move each rock and put them over there by myself, it'll take me hours. But synergy dictates that, hey, look here, if I got someone with me, Working in harmony, we doing this together. We will achieve more as a team than we were doing individually. Scripture. So watch what God says here. Genesis 11 verse 6. And the Lord said, he's coming down, he's looking at what these guys are doing now. Now he isn't judging them, watch it, because he's about to release a rule. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one. But let's be clear, these were not people of God. These were heathens. These were demonic worshipers. These were wicked people. But it doesn't change the rules. That's what I'm trying to get to you. He says, behold, the people are one. And they all have one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. My God. I hope you all listen to this. I hope you all listen to this. Listen to what the scripture says here, right? Because it's given some, I mean, some profound nuggets. Remember, these people that God is referring to, whose leader is Nimrod. You can go do your research on that. He's saying that even though they're engaged in an evil enterprise, because they are on one accord, because they're speaking the same language, meaning that if you ask Deidre Sapham about what we're doing, when you ask me, I should be able to give you the same answer. We are on one accord, meaning we are speaking the one same language. The Bible say these two ingredients will now produce a supernatural event, something that you could not achieve before. But because you are on with one language, because you are moving on one accord, there's no bucking heads. There's no who's the boss, who's the priest. There's none of that. The Bible says, whatever you and Deidre imagine to do will not be restrained, will not be withheld, will not be hindered from you. So don't tell me nobody working on witchcraft on you. Don't tell me nobody working on OB. Don't tell me the boss. No, 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 no. If you're not on one accord, 
If you're not speaking, if you're downplaying your partner, if you're telling your mommy how no good your husband is, if you're telling your 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 your, your father how no good this wife is, she don't cook for you. You are not speaking the same language. You are not on one accord. That's why you all can't achieve. That's why you all been married for 15 years and there's been no success, no accomplishment. Why? Because you're violating the laws of unity. Get out of here. Get out of here. I know the preacher tell you, you can sow seed and you can get unity. You and him are liars. No. So you see why now I'm pointing out protocols. I'm pointing out principles. I'm pointing out rules. Because if the preachers are not telling you this, then you are going around that same mountain you went around last year again. Look at the rules. Verse 6 of Genesis 11. And the Lord said, listen who's saying this. The Lord said, behold, the people is one. That's what he said. That's what I read. He says, behold, the people is one. So what does that mean? While they're building the tower, I so love this. I love to give this analogy. So the guy who mixes in the cement and the guy who got to push the cement and the guy who's throwing the brick up there, nobody's complaining. Nobody's saying I should be in charge. I should be the chief cement maker. Give me this barrel. Huh? Uh, let me roll this. I am the, I'm the eldest over here. None of that. No. Everybody, even though they were heathens, but they understand the rules. So you see what I say to you, when it comes to laws, when it comes to rules, the, 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 the manifestation of what those rules will, will produce, it is not looking to see if you black, white, if you save or unsafe, if you are black Israelite or you are the real Jews. This is why I tell you all, stop getting hooked up on this trash talk. And I call Call it trash talk because it will not produce the promises if you are in opposition of the word. You have to look at the bigger picture. Heaven and the rules are not roaming the earth to and fro to see who is black, to see who is white, to see who is skinny, to see if you are the real Jews. Or the rules aren't going to work for you unless you are the real black Israelite. No. And I'm not making fun of you. I am saying put things in perspective. Is the law, is this a protocol? Now, if I saw in the Bible, the only way you could be on one accord if you are a black Hebrew or you are the real Jew. Oh, you got my full attention now. Oh, I don't want to hear nothing. In fact, I can go preach this. But it's not a part of the protocol. So why are you putting emphasis on these things? That is going to produce none of the promises. Foolishness. Nonsense, utter garbage. So this is why for me, listen, I don't care. And many of them come at me. Don't come at me, buddy, because I listen to you. I listen, I listen to you. So let's look at some more rules on unity. So let's go to Ecclesiastes. Let's look to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And we're going to read from verse 9 to verse 12. I still love this. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I hope you're loving this tonight because you see, I'm very excited. I was all hype about this message from, I was supposed to come on last night, but uh, I was still kind of, Little, I wouldn't, I'm not under the weather, but I was more congested. I'm a little bit free tonight. And uh, trying to get some rest. I know a lot of you saying, Kevin, I know you're supposed to have a call. And I, I listened. I was sick. I was tired. But it, when I pull through, trust me, I'm going to follow up on my promise. I promise you that. But I'm trying to stay away from the internet and all this stuff unless I have to uh, teach. Okay? So Ecclesiastes, I love this one. I love this. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, right? 4 verses 9 to 12. Listen, it's now we're still dealing with the rules, the protocols, the procedures to uh to achieve unity. You know, I don't know about you. I I, I love unity in my marriage. And even when Deidre and I buck heads or start around each other, you know, we have made it a point. And I'm not saying this to sound like we have the perfect marriage, because we don't. What we do though is try our best to stick by the rules. And even when we disagree with each other, we always have this common goal to try to make it right. It ain't going to be no two and three hours not speaking to each other or going in the room and closing the door or jumping in the car and going somewhere and not talking to each other or even worse, going to friends and talking bad with one another. No, 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 no. That will never happen in this marriage because we understand the laws of unity. And if we want to achieve the many things we have on, the uh, burner right now to produce and to help others with, we got to work as a team. We have to look past our personal feelings and our personal hurts, hurry up, resolve it, and move 
forward primarily, especially if we're going to pray to God before we go to bed. You can't go pray and you have odds with this person. The Bible says, while praying, forgive others so that your heavenly father could forgive you. Okay? In the book of uh first or second Peter talk about how a man's prayers could be hindered if he's not in the right uh, accord with his house. So again, once we understand the rules, it puts a demand on you changing your behavior and more importantly, to kick the pettiness out of your, your way of dealing with things and be a man or woman of God in your behavior towards your spouse. Because again, you don't want anything to block what you want to achieve this year. So these are the uh, impediments that could hinder which you so it ain't nobody working no witch on you. It ain't that this one don't like you or this one's stopping it. You enable all of that spiritually when you went against the laws of God. That's what happened. So the best way to shut down all of that, be in harmony with your partner, be in harmony with your boss or your supervisor, or whatever, not to do wrong, but the Bible says submit to those who have the, the, the lead of you. Not that they must rule you, but follow the rules and protocols that are there for everybody. So that's what I would advise anyone to do, okay? So watch this. Proverbs, sorry, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning at verse 9. And again, we're still talking about the law of synergy, the law of unity. It says two are better than one, okay? Right off the bat. Because, and this is what I love, they have a good reward for their labor. So you see there? They just said in a nutshell what I just said to you just now. What the scripture is saying, two are better than one, meaning that you will get a greater, excuse me, a greater produce, a greater outcome, a greater harvest if you have more people involved than someone doing it alone. But in this case here, and again, this scripture is going to be a part of my teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I think it's going to be excellent. It says two. In other words, Kevin, you and Deidre, are better than you doing it on your own. And this is why God said in his word, I didn't make this up, because people say to me all the time, well, Kevin, uh, I don't think it's God's will for everyone to be married. Well, I never said that. However, what I can say to you, based on the rules, because that's what I go by, not opinions, God said in his word, he said in Genesis, it is not good. And it doesn't mean that it is a bad thing, the word good, they mean it's not beneficial for the man to be alone. And this is the reason right here. Why? Because two are better than one. Two will achieve more than with one will come. Now, the only way that rule will not work is if you connect with something that you were not supposed to be connected to. I'm telling you right now. Why? Because there's no longer synergy, meaning that two or more are working together on one accord, speaking one language, they will now produce more than they were producing as individuals. An antagonistic relationship is you still have the two people, but in this case, they're working against each other. So therefore, the time they spend rowing and arguing with each other, they're, they're, they're on pause. Life is still going. Everybody's still going ahead. So they're like 15, 20 years behind, all because they refuse to agree. They refuse to agree to disagree. They refuse to respect each other. They refuse to honor each other's role in the relationship. So what happened? Stagnation, limitation, non-progress, anti-progress. These are the fruit that would be produced from such a relationship. So in that case, one will be better. It would have been better if you stayed by yourself than connecting with something that's causing you not to advance, not to increase, not to go forward. So this is why this teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage is a necessity that we're going to put aside all of the foolish talks and the foolish ideologies, and we're going to see the real reason why we should be together, not just for sex, making love, making babies, or whatever, building big house and driving around stupid fancy cars. No, the idea is to achieve in life, not just for you and the spouse, you know, where you're going to achieve not only to take care of your needs, but now to become a source for others in life. So this is why God said in his word, he said, it is not good or it is not beneficial, Adam, that you be alone. He, listen to what God says now. He says now, again, this is part of my teaching. I'm going to create for you, I love this, a help me, someone who will assist you, not rile you all day, someone who will aid you, not criticize you all day, someone I'm going to pick specifically for you, Adam, 
where y'all are going to speak the same language and y'all are going to be on the same accord. Now, when I say same language, I mean they all speak in English or they all speak in Spanish, meaning that she respect his role as the priest of this home. She don't talk down to him when things get bad, you good for nothing, lazy, you know what? He don't say to her, she's a no good whore and bringing up her past. No, you're speaking with two, lang two different languages. You put aside all of that. So this is why when God made that statement, he says, it is not, oh, that, should I release this? Should I release this? Yes, release it, Kevin. He said, should I? He said, it's not good for man to be alone. And what did he do? Well, let me tell you what he didn't do. When he said it, that's why I tell you, there's a, there's a person that God has called for you. Most of us mess up. I tell you, like myself, and you go fool around and mess up with stuff and, and, and all hell break loose. When God said to him, it's good. It is not good that a man should be alone. God went and took three of Adam's ribs and made Eve, Jane, and Mary. You didn't read that. Did you read that? No. When God said it was not good for the man to be alone, he went and take one rib, just one, and specifically made out of that the one that he had in store for Adam before the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 4. God did not put Mary in the garden and Susie and Jane and, 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 and whoever else and say, Adam, now you pick. God didn't say it is not good for a man to be alone. And then he says, now, Adam, I'm giving you a choice. Go and pick. No, he didn't do that. And that was just the prerequisite for us. Now he's saying, okay, there are choices out there, but now let me lead you to the one that I have called you to be with before the foundation of the world. And so this is why I say to people, the importance of being rightly connected is going to determine the way forward. Who you connect with will determine whether you will succeed in life or whether you will lose in life. It's going to determine whether you will be delayed in life or whether you will excel in life. It's going to determine whether you're going to be stressed in life or you're going to be happy in life. It's going to, be, it's going to determine whether you're going to live the abundant life or a life of sorrow. It has got nothing to do with education. It got nothing to do with status. It got nothing to do with money. It got all to do with the right connection. I try to help you. I try to help you. I try to help you tonight. That's all I try to do. You could go, why you think, why you think, let me use this lady. Uh, I used to love to watch her movies. What's her name now? Elizabeth Taylor. Elizabeth Taylor, correct me if I'm wrong, I think I had like about what, seven, eight husbands. I don't condemn her. I don't condemn her. And I don't condemn nobody who's been married multiple times. Here is what it says to me. That person was in search, desperately, obviously, for the right person. However, they didn't allow God to lead them. Or they got connected with people who claim that God is speaking through them and telling that's the person you're supposed to marry or this the one you're supposed to marry. Just like the woman at the well. Jesus says, who's your husband? She said, blah, blah, blah. She said, no. And even the one you got now in your husband. And everybody interpret that like, oh, Jesus saying, oh, you in the adultery, this and that. No, he's saying, yeah, and, you, and even the one you're with now in the one I had in, in store for you before the foundation of the world. So to avoid that, you have to say, God, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. I'm understanding now. Life is spiritual. Everything was already put in place for me spiritually. So therefore, Father God, Forgive me for trying to do this on my own. Forgive me for trying to go through life without the aid of your Holy Spirit, who is responsible for leading me into all truth. Forgive me for giving monies to find my perfect person. Forgive me for buying oils and drinking concoctions and doing spiritual bath to attain the things that you've given freely. When all I had to do was say, Lord, I submit to your will. Father, I honor you. Now, infuse me with, according to uh, Isaiah 11, Verse 2, infuse me or, or endow me with the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, so that I would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that whenever he or she come my way, this is what God said, and the evidence would be there to prove it. Why? And what is one of the first evidence? <coughs> Excuse me. My connection with this person, is it must, not might, it must produce more than what I was doing by myself. Because that's the law of synergy. That's the law of unity. 
it is impossible to be connected to the right place. It is impossible to be connected to the right person. It is impossible to be connected to the right environment and still not producing or still averaging. It is a part of the law of synergy, a part of the law of unity. In fact, the evidence of it that you're rightly connected, it is mandatory that you produce more. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. I trying to help you tonight. So back in Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse nine, he says two are better than one. That's what I'm reading. Because, that's what I love, because they have a good reward for their labor. Mighty God, good. Why did he say good reward? Why didn't he just say they have a reward? Why didn't he say what? Just remember the word good, look it up, beneficial. Meaning that whatever they produce, it's going to be beneficial for the relationship, beneficial for them. He says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. So if we are working together, we are on one accord. We Nobody can infiltrate this relationship and tell us how to run this. No one could come and whisper in Deidre yes, well, I hear Kevin was over. So she should shut them down. Even if it's true, shut them down. Even if they come to me, well, you know Deidre ain't being faithful. Shut up. Get out of here. Get why you're giving air to the devil e listen to what i say even if it's true you see this between you two and this is where people get in problem anybody could come in the relationship the, the chinese man could come all the way from china who don't even speak their language and they've beaten up their partner they want divorce right away one language one accord and nothing shall be able to be restrained from us we ain't listening to know anyone who's coming to this relationship and trying to put poison in here, who's trying to bring discord. You see, and you should be so connected with who you're connected with that you could sense that in their approach, sense that in their whole persona when they came up to you. Child, I don't really talk people business. Well, why are you talking it now? Well, somebody say or so, well, what, listen, in the name of Christ, get out of here. Because the minute you start giving air to that, watch and see, you're going to be lonely just like them, desperate just like them, negative just like them, manless and womanless just like them. Just like them. Why? Simply because you don't know when to put the brakes on them. Shut them down. Listen to me carefully. Even if it's true, that's for you and your spouse to deal with. Child, I didn't want to get in nobody's business. Well, why are you getting in my business then? You just say you don't want to get in the business. Well, why are you in this? Set it. If you don't set them straight, they can set you straight. I'm telling you that now. Okay? So two are better than one. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9. Because they have a good reward for their labor. Verse 10. For if they fall, mighty God, this is how we know they're on one accord now. If they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. Meaning that if Deidre made a mistake or I did. According to this rule, he didn't say attack her. He didn't say cuss her out. He didn't say ridicule her. He didn't say to her, well, talk down to Kevin and tell him he ain't no man and tell him he ain't no provider, even if he's not providing. He said the purpose of this unity is to assist, to uplift one another, not to pull them down, not to embarrass them, not to step outside of the relationship because things aren't good now. Because when that happened, when the first uh, method of operation, when trouble hit the relationship, they, they want to retreat, that, that speaks volumes. You were never on one accord. You were, your, your, your one accord was conditional, meaning that as long as things were going good, well, he's the best thing since life's bread. That's my hero. Yeah, he's here. He, he will become a zero when he can't provide no more, when he lost the job, when things didn't turn out the way that they all thought it would have happened. All of a sudden now, he's a loser, or she's a loser, or he's she's a whore, and all these nasty. So what that tell me, listen, I love rules, I love rules. The Bible says out of the abundance of a person's heart, their mouth will begin to speak, meaning that all of what you're spewing now, this was always overflowing in your heart. You just needed the right opportunity to let it come out verbally. I love scripture. I love the rules. I love it. So verse 10 of Ecclesiastes 4 says, For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. 
but woe to him that is alone when he falleth. For he had not another to help him. So this is what he's saying, because I hear people saying, it's child Kevin, I ain't getting married because I ain't into this and I ain't into that. You got your choice. I ain't knocking you. But let's look at the rules. When you home and that when the cold come uh, minus 60 degrees, you better grab that blanket. You better grab them pillow. You better squeeze that because you ain't got no woman to hold on to. You ain't got no man to hold on to. Okay? You know what the Bible says? Woe. You know what the word woe means? Sorrow. Pain. Grief. Woe to him that is alone. So while you're telling everybody else, child, I know, but y'all, y'all, y'all getting married and let these man hold y'all down and all committed to this one woman and thing. I live in my life. I live in my best life. Right. Right. You live in your best life. And right up here. <laughs> you live in it right. That's as far as it will go. I am reading, maybe my Bible print different. Proverbs 4, verse 10. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. Mm -hmm. But woe or sorrow to him that is alone. When he falleth, for he have not another to help him up. Hence, the Bible says all the way from the beginning in Genesis, it is not good for the man to be alone. In other words, it is not beneficial. It will not profit him. Because when trouble come, when days of sorrow and pain and grief and challenges, who are you going to talk to? Who are you going to lean on for advice? Who? Mommy done dead. Daddy dead. They were your confidence in life, confidence in life, where you can go now. Because you don't brag to everybody, you live in your best life. You all about taking pictures on Facebook, all about in Europe, all about in Pakistan by yourself, stand up on them big uh, pyramids by yourself, stand up by the camel by yourself, all about Alaska, all about I'm living my best life by yourself. <laughs> uh -uh. Let me read it again. Woe to him that is alone when he falleth. You better don't fall off them pyramids. You better don't fall off them old camel down there in Egypt. You better don't fall off them uh, slopes up there in Colorado by yourself. <laughs> I only tell you what the scripture tells me. So he says, for if one fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth. For he have not another to help him up. Verse 11 of Ecclesiastes 4. Again, meaning I'm repeating this. Again, if two lie together, they, sorry, if two lie together, then they have heat, okay? But how can one be warm alone? How could you be living your best life in the bed by yourself? You're 40, 45, 50, huh? You're married. But yet you posting up all these pictures on Twitter. I live in my best life. I live in the abundant life. You was a clown. You was a clown because at the end of the day, I don't care what you say to me. You have need for another person. You 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 desire you will desire at some point. Boy, I wish I wish I had married. I wish no. So what you got to do now? You got to settle. So now you got to marry this fella. All right? Because you shame now this fella who nine hundred and sixty five. Okay, with this last set of four teeth on the right side of this mode. And now you got to go with that because all of the good potentials you had later, you keep picking, picking, picking until you pick this fella here with this last four teeth in this mode. Now what you can do? Huh? So that's why I told you, read your Bible. Read what the instructions say. <laughs> what did the instructions say? See, once you read that, you now make better decisions in life. Because you can't be living your best life by yourself. Whatever God gave you, he gave it to you to share and to help and to assist with. You can't. So now when you go up Alaska, you go on them uh, Alaskan cruise and take five, minus five and eight degrees. You in the cabin all by yourself. Mighty God. No heat. No, he said the heat only can come with two. I read no heat coming with one. Again, verse 11. If two lay together, then they have heat. See, the two bodies could generate heat, okay? But how can one be warm alone? And I see a question mark there. So the scripture is asking you. I mean, you tell me. Because according to you, you're living your best life. All right? Verse 12 of Ecclesiastes 4. And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand. So if somebody coming against Deidre and her husband Kevin come there, two of us will be in a better position to resist the opposition than Deidre standing by herself. So verse 12 says, and if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord 
it's not quickly broken. So all throughout these scriptures, in, in terms of synergy, it's speaking of the importance, meaning that nothing in God creation, he created to stand on its own. Some way, somehow, it is supposed to connect with something or something else. It, just when they're making medicine, perfume, you name it, is a, when you, even simple as baking a cake, it is the combination of different things coming together to give us this result here. So as it is with man and woman in terms of a relationship, so is it with nature. So and if I'm not reading the Bible to get what these rules are saying, then guess what? I am prone to make errors in life. I am prone to make costly decisions. Now, the truth is, if I'm young, if I'm in my late teens, early 20s, I'll even go as far as 25, and if I mess up, well, I got plenty more years ahead to redeem myself. But if you go and go take these chances when you mid-age and so on, I mean, come on, you're telling me now you can finally settle, because that's what you're doing now, because those options aren't there anymore. You're finally settling at the age of 50 or 45. And you're, because you're settling, this isn't what you really want, but you just want to show everybody you could get married. And now you're going to spend the next five years, if this marriage lasts this long, under complete turmoil, under complete pressure, stress, nothing which you imagine. So you wait until your change of life to settle down with sorrow, to settle down all because you're trying to paint this image that you don't need somebody else. So when I hear women talking foolish, I don't need no man or, or some guy talking fool, but man, look, you're all women, is this, and I don't need that. Blah, blah, blah. You sound stupid because according to the scriptures, not my opinion, you're setting yourself up. So you could take that road. I, I'm not here to tell you what and what not to do. Only the scriptures does that. But as I would have read to you, you've been given both scenarios. If you're connected and if you're not connected, and what the positive or even negative effects uh, uh, could have in the future, all right? I want us to look at another one, and I'm going to look at one more after that, then I'm going to bring this to an end, and then I'm going to pick up tomorrow night where we're going to go even deeper, and we're going to be dealing with uh, the law of diligence. We're going to do like two scriptures, then we're going to go to a cadre of scriptures, cadre of scriptures dealing with uh, diligence. And then I'm going to go to prudence, and all of this, well, tomorrow is going to lead into Saturday, into our teachings. I'm just giving you some rules, okay? So the next one we're going to go into is the law of faithfulness, all right? So let's go to Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 20. Proverbs 28 and verse 20. And like I've been reiterating to you guys, when you see the Bible as a book of laws, remember life is spiritual, this is important because the Bible is a spiritual book that is given to a spiritual being like yourself and me. We're spiritual beings housed in this physical body, all right? Now, the rules that we follow or the rules that we have to be paying attention to primarily is the spiritual rules because the way that the spiritual rules work is that once we engage those rules, they bring about basically a supernatural manifestation, meaning that there's no other way that this could have happened outside of this protocol and us enjoy it the way that God intended it to be. Okay? So watch this. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 20. A faithful man, this is powerful, a faithful man shall, not might, shall abound with blessings. Now, this is very, very, very powerful, very, very powerful, and I just want to break this down a little bit, okay? So I'm looking at the word faithful here in this Hebrew, all right? And the word is translated emonah, emonah. Yeah, I guess that's what it is, okay? It's a feminine noun, and it means firmness, fidelity, steadfastness, steadfastness, a person that's committed, all right? So with that understanding in mind, let's go back. A faithful man. Now, faithful doesn't necessarily or only is reserved to a marriage. They're faithful in their work. They're faithful with their promise. 
they're faithful, but they're cho- whatever it is, they're just they're committed. Whatever they said, they will actually do, and they will commit to the manifestation of the promise that was made. So the scripture is saying here now, a faithful man, and I want you to write this down because tomorrow when we go into a prudent woman and a prudent man, this is going to be a part of it because, in, and I'm talking to those who are not married, in your quest for seeking the right mate, and I, and I know what you've been told in the past, especially you ladies, when it comes to uh, your mother in particular advising you, and they would tell you, find a man who could take care of you, find a man who could provide for you and put you in a house and so on. And now that from the surface sound really good, but in most cases that could be an erroneous advice. It'd be erroneous advice. And here is why. You, it's easy for a woman to find a man who seemingly could take care of her in the beginning, right? But there's so much about this man you may not know. He may be uh, uh, riddled with depression, he may be bipolar. So while he may be able to do that, he could just trip and not be that consistently. So what we want to look at is what the Bible say to look for, such as a prudent wife, the book of Proverbs talk about, or in this case, a faithful man, meaning that when you first met him, he, he doesn't have what the standard is that he should have. He doesn't have the house. He doesn't, but he's faithful. He's committed to work. He's committed to doing better. That is better than a man with riches. Because you could have a man with riches, but he's not faithful. He's not committed. So in his mind, his wealth is a means of him to getting more women, getting more men, using more people. So you want a man who is committed to the relationship, a man who is committed to whatever you all set up to do. He's a man of his word. So listen why you need him, because according to spiritual protocol, it says a faithful man shall abound with blessings. So he's guaranteed blessings. Mm, Kevin, where are you going? Okay, mama say, 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 Sandra, listen to me carefully, because you know the church don't listen. Find a man who could put you in house. Not a man who can be faithful. Not a man who's going to be dedicated to rich. All they're looking at, is the material side of life. Make sure you find a man who working in the bank, girl. You understand what they saying to you? Make sure the man working in the bank and could take care of you. Mm. I, I think I told you on the story before. When Deidre met me, and I, I told her from day one, I, I can be real with you. I mean, you're a pretty girl and all that and got plenty of potential, but I ain't got no money. I broke like the Ten Commandments. And I, I let her know my story from start to finish. And I told her because I didn't want to deceive her. I didn't want to, her to walk into something that she was not privy to. Now, I always discuss my plans with her, what I wanted. I was always candid with her. And she will tell you whenever I spoke to her, and this was before we got married, I, she would never hear me say the word I. I this or I can get this. Or, I was always we. Because at that point, even though I'd suffered great loss, and my life was really in backward motion, I came to the realization, of course, through the scriptures, that two were better than one. And at that point, I'd already know that Deidre was the person for me. I mean, she had passed all the tests I had mysteriously and secretly put in place for her. And I just knew her whole persona, her whole way of just being a giving and supportive. This was what I wanted. So even though there was no evidence of what my life would become like it is now to take care of her and provide for her and all this other stuff and, and for us to be a blessing to other people. I honestly didn't fathom that in my mind to that extent, but I knew with the right support, again, based on what I've said in the scriptures, I knew with the right person, connected to the right person, I knew. Not someone who think they're above me, not someone who talked down, not, none of that. I know with the respect we both have for each other, and we're not just compatible in just being Christians, but in every other area, especially the more important areas. I just knew that life. And she would tell you, I would say to her all the time, I say, D, I'm going to put you in your own home and you're going to be going to be debt free. You're not going to be going to pay no more. And I used to repeat this to her over and over. And anyone that knows me, especially my friends, whenever I settle to do something, I'm very repetitive in what I'm about to do meaning I talk about it a lot. 
And when I talk about it, it's not too bright. What I'm doing is I'm constantly reminding myself of my goal and what I'm committed to. So she will tell you, I, I would say to her over and over, I say, D, trust me, this little rough patch, this little rough patch we're going through right now, this thing will be forever. And she believed in me. And this is something I, I could never stop loving this woman for this one reason. She believed me from start to finish. Sometimes I would sit, I say, D, trust me. Once we overcome this particular thing here, watch and see what's going to happen. I say, God is going to make this happen for us. Not because I say in this D, I say because we're following the rules. Now I know, and some, and she will tell you, and sometimes she'd be like, boy, this fellow faith is just too great. I ain't on that level. And she would even tell me that. And I say, don't worry about it. I said, your support is just all I need. I say, and you're going to see happen, see things happen. And she could tell you, me who basically, when she met me, had literally, I literally had no money in the bank. I had nothing, basically nothing. I told you that. But with the right person in my life and someone who saw beyond where we were, and many times we sit having bad talk and begin to reflect and begin to see the importance of being rightly connected in life. And rightly connected does not mean meeting someone who's already coming with the full package. Because there may be things in that package you may not like later on down the road. It is important to seek people who you could build with, who you could see yourself as a team with. Not someone where you figure you have the edge because you hear they, or you see they have a lot of money or they come from a family that's rich, you are setting yourself up. The same way that family got their money or they're rich or the person you're born, God has given you the ability to acquire wealth also. But you have to follow the rules. So that's what I'm saying to you. And this is sound advice to many of you right now. A lot of the trash your parents told you about the people that you should be looking for, if it is not lining up with this Bible, such as a faithful person, such as a prudent person, such as a wise person. See, these are the things. These are people who think before they speak and look before they leap. These are people, when they make decisions, the decision isn't based on what's happening right now. The decision is to sustain them beyond right now. These are the people who don't see you as, for example, they when they get upset with you and they make remarks such as without me, you would be nothing. When I met you on the street as a dog and you had no money in the bank. No. In their head, because you like I, me and Deidre and from day one, it was always us, we, us, we, us, we never. I Kevin or I Deidre. We were always a team going forward. Even when she didn't understand the direction we were going in because I have proven myself to her repeatedly. She was able to trust me. So it was never a one-sided thing. It was never Kevin money. It was always our money. Even if Kevin made the money or even if she made the money, it was us. It was we. You don't have this today. You don't. You don't. And the reason you don't have it today is because it starts off that way. But people accept it because they figure, well, well, that's my husband and my wife. And so if they have the money, then that's no, 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 no. If that isn't made crystal clear from the get-go, from the get-go, it was never, and I'm not saying this is for everybody. It was never Deidre account. Every account we have, everyone, it is Deidre and Kevin. It is no secret account for Kevin and a secret account. See, if you don't. If you start off by saying, well, I need to get a prenup, you should not be married. You should not connect with nobody. You should stay by yourself. If you more in fear of losing your wealth than using, losing the relationship that God has blessed you with, you, you, you need surgery on your brain. I'm telling you, if, if take my simple advice. If you are getting married for sex, if you're getting married for status, if you're getting married because this person uh, seemingly could give you a better life because of their wealth. This has nothing to do with your love. This has nothing to do with you being a good wife or a good husband. This has, all this has to do with is that they have the means to make me happy. You should not marry. Stay by yourself. Stay by yourself. I, I, in, in, in that regard, I promote your best life by yourself, in that only. But do not, if you, if you are dating someone, I want you to hear me, 
If you are dating someone, and whenever they speak about the future, it is always I, 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 get up and leave right now. And if they come back and you check them on and they say, well, no, I, well, you know, I so used to saying it. No, 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 no. See, out of the abundance of the heart, if you're not saying, if you say we, 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 we all the time without somebody even reminding you of it, then you're speaking from the heart. If you're always saying, I, 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 you're speaking from the heart. So you're basically telling this person before you even marry them, I can tell you now, your things is your things and my things is my things. So whenever we row, that's my TV, okay? That 24-inch over there is yours and that 37 inches is my own over there. And those socks, I bought them for you. So they might, when a person behave in that manner, please hear me if you hear nothing else. Run for your life. You don't even have to explain it to them. Just tell them, I can't do this no more. You have a good life. And go find someone who loves the eyes like you do. Because I'm telling you, if you marry that person and you overlook all the signs that was, I mean, basically red flag city, whole red flag parade, and you ignore that, then whatever you get out of that, you deserve it. Run for your life. Remember, especially if you're older, especially you that hit 35, you're not married, but you're seeking married. It is even more important that you connect with the right people in life. And I'm telling you, they don't need to be wearing a shirt that says, I'm going to destroy your life. Just listen to what they're saying to you all the time. Just listen. Listen how they brag about the women that they dated. Listen how she talk about the type of men that she... When you hear that you are dealing with superficial people, you are dealing with people who are all about aesthetics, all about uh, cosmetics. They're superficial. There's no root to them. They can't deal with losses in life. They can't deal with the loss of a home, a car, or temporary setbacks in life. They will literally lose their minds. There will be no help to you because whatever comes out of their mouth is pure worry and sadness and grief and negativity. But you would have seen all of this prior to, but because you so fix on the breasts, the hips, the implants, the hair, or the nice cars, or the Gucci wallet, and all of these things are just traps luring you. Come, keep coming, keep coming, until you fall into the pit and you can't get out. So the signs are there. So I don't care how old you are, and I don't care how bad you want to be married. Do not become so desperate that you are willing to sacrifice your peace of mind, because that's what it's really coming after. You are willing to sacrifice your peace of mind just to tell the public, you're married. Just to post pictures on Facebook to say you're living the best life. Just to say, hey, look, we got it going on. When the truth is, when Facebook done closed down, you turn off your Twitter, you're fighting like cats and dogs. You're sleeping in separate rooms. You can't wait to get on the phone to tell your girlfriend, your mother, your cousin, your uncle, your fourth cousin, how you made the biggest mistake of your life. Only to start the cycle all over the next morning by going on Facebook and posting pictures again. When the truth is, you hate the dirt this person walk on. All I can do is give you advice. All right? Don't judge me. <laughs> I'm telling you what the advice is. So the Bible says, and I love the scripture, Proverbs 28 and verse 20, a faithful man, I love it. And again, man here is just generic of man or woman. A faithful man, this is the kind of person you want, someone that is faithful, someone that is committed, someone, and you will always know when someone truly loves you. All right? A person who truly loves you will see the good in everything, no matter how bad it, no matter what you come to them with. Honey, I just lost my job today. Baby, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. I, we still have my paycheck. We could just do this until um, you get sorted out. We just cut back on a few things. We'll be in this together. Okay? This ain't you by yourself. Yeah, you lost your job. And yes, I know you feel bad about it. Yes, you feel embarrassed or why they had to cut you. Yeah, but remember, you have me. Now, you may not have enough, but guess what? Let her or him know we're in this together. See, this is the key, you know. If, if you're not making it clear that we're in this together, then this is where you find I meet a lot of people like this when I do counseling. You have a lot of people that are, that are married, but they're alone. Because any kind of trouble, any kind of tragedy come, but that fella ain't checking for them. That woman ain't checking for them. You better go figure it out. You by yourself. You have, uh, you, you console, console more than your friend or your family member than your wife or your husband. Because the only time you see them, 
is when good news or, or something happened or new something happened in the relationship, then they show up. So you're married, but you're lonely. I know that sounds crazy, but it's a reality. But again, let's be clear. You saw the signs. You see, when you were just looking at the wrong things, you ignored the signs. But the truth is when you married the problem, now those signs still fly again. But it was easy to get in and get out now. So I'm just giving you sound advice. All right? Sound advice where you could, you could some of you right now getting married Saturday coming or probably tomorrow Friday. You don't get the horse and carriage and 568 people standing in the bridal party and all this other stuff. But deep down, deep down, you know you're making the greatest mistake of your life. Deep down, this fella and put his hands on you. Deep down, this woman already cursed you one day and cursed your mouth, your daddy and everybody. And after they calm down, they're saying to you, well, I only said that because, you know, I had a few drinks or I was just feeling so down. Or you remember I was abused as a child. No, 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 no. Let's go back to the rules. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak on you. Your mouth is talking on you. You didn't do that because you were just angry. You didn't do that because I made you upset. You did that because according to the Bible, it was an overflow of what was always in your heart. And now the opportunity presented yourself, and so you let me have it. Now, either I can believe the Bible or I can believe your sad story. Again, let's go back here. Proverbs 20, verse 20. A faithful man, I love it, shall abound with blessings. So God is saying, don't go look for a richy rich. Don't go look for a rich cougar. No, look for someone who is faithful because God is now making a promise to that person. They will abound with blessings. They may not have nothing when you meet them. They may be struggling or even in a worse position when you met them. But God says to look for this. Look for faithfulness. Are they committed to the God that they claim to serve? Do they have children? Are they committed to those children? Are they committed to the well being? See, you look for faithfulness, which will come through commitment. So God is now telling you, he says, now, why I'm telling you to look for one who is faithful? Because I will ensure, I, God, that they are bound with blessings. Meaning that they will have more than enough to take you, take care of you and even in them. So a faithful man shall abound with blessings. But listen now, but he that make it haste to be rich shall not be innocent. So what is that saying? A person who go out there who wants to be rich. Let's use this scenario. They want to be rich by meeting this guy because if I marry him who's already rich, then I'll be rich too. So the Bible says that he that make it haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Meaning that they will do anything to attain wealth. If it takes sleeping with this person, having sex with them, whatever, whatever they're into, they are willing to do that, to form an alliance with this person, true marriage or whatever. But the Bible says, listen, this person here, that's a dangerous person. They will compromise their health. They will compromise their peace. They will compromise whatever because they have to have an outward appearance, a presentation. They have to have the status of wealth or whatever it is. And the Bible said they will do anything. So scripture is saying, look for the faithful person. Look for them. Oh, I so love it. You all listen to this. Listen, I hope you all getting this, you know. Listen, the, the Bible says a faithful man shall, I love it, shall abound. Mighty God, you all hear this? All reading this, a faithful man shall abound with blessings. So I look up the word abound in this original Hebrew, right? And the Hebrew word for abound is rab. And listen what it means, R-E-B. Listen what it means. It means much, many, great. It means to be numerous, more than enough, greater than exceedingly and abundantly. So the Bible say a faithful man, I love it, shall abound with uh Hold on a minute of this now. A faithful man shall abound with blessings. Meaning that when you marry such a person, mighty God, oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. God, I love your word so much. I love it. I just got another scripture. There's a scripture. I can wrap up right here. Again, I can wrap up right here. There's a scripture in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 22, I believe it is. Yes. Because Proverbs verse 18 verse 21 says, uh, 
uh, death and life is in the power of the tongue. Okay, good. So verse 22, listen what it says now. It's another promise. It says, he that findeth a wife, mm -hmm, findeth a good thing. Now, this is going to be powerful now because we need to define a wife isn't just a woman who's married to a man. Oh, no, 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 no. See, there are different types of wives. And I don't want to go in, but I can give you a little taste of it. The Bible, and I'm not going to tell you the scripture though, speaks about a prudent wife. So when you look up the word prudent and it speaks about this wife, it is different from just having a wife. Help me now. Okay, so watch this now. So it says, he that finds a wife, because it's a promise now, attached to this protocol, he that finds a wife finds a good thing. Now in this particular story, okay, in this particular rule, the truth is, it doesn't matter who you marry. A rule is attached to it, okay? And the ruler or the promise is, he that finds a wife finds a good thing and shall obtain favor from the Lord. So incorporated for a man, whenever he joins himself with a woman, it is automatic for him to obtain favor from God. Let's see what the Bible didn't say. And I always say it this way because I know the religious fanatics. It didn't say he that finds a Christian wife. It didn't say a Christian that find a Christian man that find a Christian wife. Everything is generic in this particular promise. He, the word he means this is referring to all men. The word wife, because he wasn't specific of the wife, anyone that gets a wife, they are entitled to this. The man that is is entitled to a promise of favor. So what that means is if this guy get in the jam, right, things are tough in the marriage, financially, whatever, even though this man does not know God, he has a right based on this scripture to ask, to request, to beseech favor from the living God. See, again, this is how we understand scripture. It is only when the Bible is specific. For example, the Bible says that Let's look at our Proverbs uh, 11, verse 21. And it says that, Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not go unpunished. Now watch this, this promise. But the seed or the offspring or the children of the righteous, see it's being specific now, shall be delivered. It didn't say, but it didn't say, but the children of men shall be delivered. It was specific. So saying that if, if I, Kevin, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, I'm a righteous person. So the Bible says, my children, because me being righteous, because I decide to honor God, because I decide to fear him, because I decide to reverence him, according to scripture, my children don't have to earn now being delivered in this sense. That when trouble come their way, God now have to now go back to his own rules. Well, okay, KJ is getting into some trouble. And you know what? He's deserving of this trouble. But I made a promise to his righteous father, Kevin. And that promise is, I have to deliver KJ. So you, you see, in studying God's laws, rules, principles, and protocols, again, you got to read the Bible for yourself. Because for the most part, if some nutcase is preaching this to you who just wants your money, they're not going to take their time and unfold the scriptures or unpack it like I would. Because I want you to understand who the scripture is talking to, why they're saying it. Who's the one saying these promises and how does one qualify for it? So we break it down and it says the righteous, the seed of the righteous, the children of the righteous shall be delivered. But again, going back to Proverbs 18, verse 22, he that findeth a wife, he meaning any man that end up marrying any woman, even if it's the wrong woman for him, even if it's the one he's not supposed to be connected to, according to the ambiguity, what's the word now, of that scripture, meaning that it's not being specific in terms of it didn't say a righteous wife, it didn't say a righteous man. Anyone that gets married, God obviously realized the difficulty of being married is still extending favor to this man, even though he or even she may not be believers of God himself. So this is why I say to you, I need when someone is teaching me or preaching the Bible to me, I need it to make sense because what I'm doing now 
because of my understanding of scripture, I'm looking at a protocol to follow to get the results that this person is preaching about. And it's there in the scriptures. So I don't need nobody to come and try to fluffy it up or pretty it up or riddle it up for me. I don't need that. What I need is the exact protocols. So now when I go before God, when I'm facing whatever, I'm, I'm going to remind him of his word. I cannot remind him of the preacher word because the preacher word was in the promise from God. I need the word of the living God. So this is the importance of being connected rightly. So again, a faithful man, that's who you're looking for, or a faithful woman, that's who you're looking for. And I know, fellas, I, I, I can finish again. <laughs> fellas, I know what you're looking at. You're looking at pretty, you want, like we say in the Bahamas, you want buying the skin, right? You know what Deidre told me? Deidre said to me, Kevin, once you go black, you cannot go back. And I agree with the woman. Clearly, <laughs> I ain't turning back to nothing else. But on a serious note, what I'm saying to you is that I cannot put enough emphasis on the Bible being your guide. The rules are there. And tomorrow night when we get back into this, I'm going to take you in deeper into protocols that even though you weren't a Christian, you follow them and they manifested for you, even though you weren't a Christian. So life is spiritual, hence God gave us a spiritual manual, which is the Bible. And you cannot take a preacher, don't even take my word, I always tell you this, Go everything I tell you, go back and research for yourself. Read it for yourself. And you will see for yourself if you practice it. Everyone else who's telling me, Kevin, thank God for you, you show me this and that, and I followed it in this manner, you, you will be one singing the same praises to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, thanking him that you came across someone who's showing you what this book is all about. It's just not a book you run to for trouble. It is a book, if you follow the rules, then you will get what the rules say. Okay, so we'll pick this up tomorrow. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words, your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding. We thank you for these powerful nuggets that you gave us tonight, causing us to look deeper into the spiritual book because it is our desire to get the physical manifestation of of the spiritual promise that you promise. And the only way that that can happen, we have to follow the spiritual rules. We cannot do it our way. We cannot do what the preachers say if he's going outside of the laws of God. We cannot, you said in your word, in Galatians chapter one, verses eight to nine, that if anyone, okay, preach another gospel outside of the original gospel of Christ, let that person be a curse. That is what your word says. Okay, and I think the book of Revelation, it says that any man who add or take away from this book, let his name be taken out of the book of life. Father, I don't want to be a part of none of that. So, Father, not only do I pray that I teach your people precisely what your word says, but I pray that they would receive it with any amendments in their mind or what it should be, but follow the exact protocol and they will get the exact results. I thank you for spiritual protocols that are supposed to bring about the manifested pro promises of God. And I pray that this year, beginning this month, that those listening to me now and those who will listen and watch these videos in the future, it will click to them that it is mandatory that they follow the spiritual laws. There's nowhere in scripture when uh, God parted uh, the Red Sea, when God parted the River Jordan, when God stopped the sun and caused it to be suspended from going down at its regular time for Joshua, when God uh, defeated the Midianites to gain all of these things and the successes of the men and women of God came as a result. This is the underlying tone for every story in the Bible. When they followed the precise principles of God. In fact, the Bible started out in our Genesis chapter 4. In Genesis chapter 4, it talks about why God did not accept the sacrifice of Cain. All right? It wasn't because he didn't have enough money. It wasn't because he didn't have a degree. The Bible said, God said to him, if, if you would do it the way you were supposed to do it, then you will get the same result as your brother Abel. So in so much word, God started out from the beginning. If you want me to bless you, if you want me to protect you, 
if you want me to watch over your family, if you want me to be your God, then the only thing I'm requiring from you is following my laws, my rules, and my principles. And you should be a faithful person in that area, meaning that no human with title or non-title alike should be able to come to you and tell you that in order for God, who have already given you his word, in order for him to do what he says in this book, you got to purchase this. You got to give that. No human, if you are committed, if you are faithful and want to abound with blessings, then you have to tell that preacher or tell that lion apostle or tell that lion whoever, this is not what the word of God is telling me to do and you are a liar. Now, I am willing for you to do whatever you need to do with me, but I'm going to stick with the living word of God because I am adamant about receiving the promises of God. And the only way that can happen is if I follow the word of God. Hence, he said in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 to 3, he said, if you shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God and observe to do not some, but all of his commandments, I shall set you on high or I will promote you, which will be the first sign that you're doing what I'm telling you to do. Then I will bless you in your going out, bless you when you're coming in, bless you in the field, bless you in the storehouses, bless you in the fruit of your body. The Bible says that the blessings will not only come upon you, but overtake you. Why is this happening? Is it happening because we amended the word of God? No. Is it happening because we're shouting and screaming and not doing the word of God? No. Why is God up causing these people to abound with blessings? Because they hearken unto the voice of the Lord that God and observed to do all his commandments. They didn't amend it. They didn't tweak it. They didn't twist it. They didn't contort it so people to worship them as opposed to the great Jehovah. So, Father, it's my prayer tonight that myself and those listening and watching, watching now and even in the future, that we will develop. In fact, we request from you to infuse us or levy upon us a spirit of faithfulness to your word, a spirit of commitment, a spirit that where the husband, wife, children, job, money, education, if all of that failed, we are committed to the rules because it's only the rules that will bring restoration. It is the rules that will be re bring recompense. It is the rules that will make the right wrongs and to fix things and bring them back in alignment with your word. No money could do that. No oil could do that. No shofar could do that. No miracle juice, Kool-Aid, uh, pineapple, nothing. What we believe is what the word of God says. We will not back down. We will not keel over. We will not compromise. We will not say, well, he say it or pass it. No. If Kevin say it and it is not lining up with the word of God, then Kevin is a liar. Kevin is an evil, wicked hypocrite. So therefore, we are not putting anybody in the place of God. To sit back and contemplate as to whether we should believe God or whether we should believe our favorite preacher. No. 2023, we are committed to not only believing the word of God, but putting a demand on every spiritual leader that leads us. Preacher, if you ain't bringing scripture, preacher, if you ain't bringing the principles of God, preacher, if you're not taking us into the bowels of the word, we don't care to hear you. Because the promises of the preacher, the riddles of the preacher, the rhymes of the preacher, the fancy talk of the preacher, the prosperity of the preacher, not a one of them have a touch at the end of it. The promises of God, if we follow the protocols of God. So therefore, no preacher, no teacher, no apostle, no bishop, no no one is above the written rules, regulations, and, 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 and procedures and protocols of the living God. We have made up in our mind this year will be different. Why? Because this year we commit and we are faithful to the word of God. And according to Proverbs chapter 20, verse 20, it says a faithful person or a faithful man or a faithful or a committed man or woman. Listen, not might, not maybe, but shall abound or be surrounded or exceedingly or abundantly be overflowing with the blessings of God. In so much words, God says, I will supersede your greatest expectation of me 
if you are faithful, not to Pastor Kevin, not to Pastor T.D. Jakes, not to Pastor Jennings, not to Pastor, if you are faithful to God, if you are faithful to his word, you shall, not might, abound with blessings. So Father, we bless you. Father, we honor you. Father, we praise you. And Father, we glorify and seal your word according to your word. Seal this prayer according to your word that says whatsoever things we desire when we pray, we must believe that we have received it and we shall have it in the name of Jesus. We thank you. We honor you. We praise you. We bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. So folks, that is it for me tonight. Tomorrow night, I will be back to continue this because Saturday, we're going to jump straight into this baby and our teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And it's all going to be scripturally based like every one of my teachings. All right? Thank all of you, all 1,600 of you that was on tonight. Of course, I'm reading this from my stream yard. And I pray that you'll be back tomorrow, bring a friend with you to come into some excuse me, life-changing information, okay? So God bless you, and you have a wonderful evening.